It has been a very insightful and intriguing day, three of PA, PILF 2020 so far. So good evening and welcome back to Studio One for Salzburg Globinas, uh, Global Seminar Session, Artificial Intelligence and Business with Dr. Anastasia Lauterbach. Anastasia Lauterbach is as well versed as it gets when it comes to economic topics. She is a C-level executive entrepreneur and serves as an independent non-executive director on seven multinationals. As founder and CEO of One EU Ventures, she advises, advises several US and European AI and cybersecurity companies, as well as investment funds and analysts. She also gained extensive management experience during her previous positions at Qualcomm, Deutsche Telekom, T-Mobile, Daimler Chrysler Financial Services, McKinsey, and Munich Re. The ITU, the specialized agency of the United Nations that deals with the technical aspects of the global information society, also draws on our interdisciplinary expertise. I now request the festival director, Dr. Manjiti Prabhu, to welcome our honored guest. Thank you, Rahul. Um, hello, Anastasia. Hi, Venture. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to PILF. It's my honor. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, actually, you know, Anastasia, I'm here on triple duty, which means I'm talking on behalf of PILF. I'm a Salzburg Global Seminar Fellow, and I'm also representing Salzburg Global Seminar today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so uh, have, you, have you ever been to India, Anastasia? Oh, yes, I've been twice and uh, both trips uh, were so memorable. Uh, you know, the diversity, the culture and then the contrast uh, in between of a highly modernized economy uh, in certain segments like high tech and then the traditional society, the food, uh, you know, the, the colors, the sounds, uh, street noise, the street pictures. On another hand, that was really overwhelming for me. Great. And how long were you here? So uh, both trips uh, were just one week uh, long, and uh, I had to uh, commute and fly uh, from New Delhi to Mumbai to Chennai. And of course, it was really tiresome because in India, you take those flights during uh, the late evening and you land in the middle of the night and then 8 a.m. you should be on in your meetings. But it was so memorable. I truly loved it. You know, they say in India, every 10 miles, everything changes, language, clothes. So just imagine such a huge country. It is, but it, it overwhelms me. So I can understand what you must be going through. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the picture froze. I can't hear you. You know. Yes, I'm back. We have so, uh, technology yeah. issues. Okay, thank you. You're back. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm back. So, yes, we've been facing a lot of challenges for this artificial, uh, not artificial, for this, for, for this festival because of the internet, but yes. we are managing. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you're going to talk about artificial intelligence today. And my mm -hmm. basic question to is, what really do you do? Oh, well, uh, you know, AI, uh, so artificial intelligence, uh, shortly AI, um, is uh, just so uh, interesting for me uh, because of three reasons, actually. First, the impact. Uh, it's uh, horizontal. It touches every aspect of economy. Um, and uh, if we listen to uh, the founder, Wired, um, Kelly, he's saying that uh, the uh, business plan for the next 10,000 companies is actually take something like medicine or agriculture and then add AI to it. So obviously a huge impact, uh, transformational impact, uh, something which can really improve economies, uh, communities and lives uh, of individuals. So this is the first, but the second is AI uh, is uh, very interdisciplinary and I'm a hugely curious person. So I uh, like uh, spending my time uh, on the borderlines of disciplines. So they, they are maths, of course, uh, you know, algorithmic uh, things, uh, mathematics, statistics. So this is one. 
but then you have uh, the science of human brain and uh, the uh, physiology of the human brain and what uh, does intelligence sit and what it is uh, overall intelligence right so this is just very interesting then the issues like what is consciousness uh, so intelligence is one but consciousness is another one so how can you define it where does it uh, locate it? so it's uh, it's really interesting and last but not least um i just feel uh, very rewarded because uh, ai attracts uh, a crowd of fantastic people and the talent there in the space is just mind blowing uh, so i love uh, spending my time with those people so well that's great so um, anastasia i'm going to leave you to talk about it uh, okay. We are all very, very eager to listen to you. So please go ahead. I'm going to yes. step out now and you take Thank the stage. You. Thank you, Manjuri. Yes. So obviously I have a private chat here where I'm going to see your questions. So just That's uh, right. free to ask and uh, we will see where it goes. So um, first of all, I would like to start with, uh, with a story which um, was around an event uh, highly catastrophic for people living in a certain area and that was um, in Fukushima uh, in Japan where in 2011 uh, there was an earthquake and a tsunami and uh, this natural catastrophe destroyed a huge region uh, put so many people out of work and out of their homes and uh, the impact of this event was not just catastrophic in terms of the impact on the life uh, of, uh, of a large uh, population, but um, during this time, uh, Japan as a country stopped reporting data. And uh, you might wonder why is it important reporting data, but, uh, you know, global economies are really connected and... Uh, Japan is a place where uh, a lot of components for modern technologies uh, and modern products are being produced, manufactured, and then they are shipped uh, to go somewhere else. And obviously, companies rely on their suppliers and vendors, and they need to know what is going on there. So can we really expect that there will be this shipment and then we can produce? So that was during the time uh, where there was a huge uncertainty around uh, the, the uh, supply chain uh, being uh, highly impacted uh, by a natural disaster. And um, uh, this uh, stopping of uh, data flow into the systems uh, of global banks, uh, you know, uh, stock exchanges uh, actually could have produced a new crisis. And we already were in 2011, and uh, as many of you might remember, 2008, we had a global financial crisis in the world, which was uh, um, having still uh, huge waves and consequences uh, for the economies and uh, lives uh, of uh, many people across the world. So, um, Dan and Bradstreet, uh, the company uh, I was on the board uh, of, uh, decided that they are going to um, synthetically reproduce the data set of Japan. And obviously, uh, they asked a question, what businesses were still there and what businesses disappeared because uh, of uh, this catastrophe? Uh, so, obviously, Dun & Bradstreet uh, is uh, the largest enterprise data company in the world. And um, what they do is uh, to collect uh, data on economies and on companies. So, uh, like, you know, Facebook uh, is uh, a large social network and uh, they have all kinds of data on individuals. And then they can, of course, mirror certain trends uh, to the society and to the economies. But... Uh, Dun & Bradstreet uh, is still focused on enterprise data. So they ask these questions, what uh, companies are still in place? Um, and uh, they did not have uh, a daughter company in Japan. So they could not just go there and look around. And how actually do you go and look around uh, if, uh, you know, something of this magnitude uh, happens and people are just busy to save themselves, to save their families. And uh, so what is uh, re remaining from their businesses? So um, 
Then at Bradstreet has never invested uh, into technologies to do certain things after natural disasters. It was not their core competence, but they um, had talent in place. And uh, there were a number of uh, individuals on a data science team, uh, like six people with very diverse background. So there was someone who, who was a physicist. And this person, uh, from just his uh, pedigree, from his educational background, understood radiation. Uh, then there was uh, someone who was very skilled in geography and had, uh, you know, this uh, background. Uh, and of course, there were mathematicians. And uh, they decided uh, to innovate uh, as a team to develop uh, new uh, algorithms and new models to forecast uh, the whole set of the Japanese economy after um, this uh, Fukushima disaster took place. Uh, so they worked for six weeks. They got data from sources which were unseen and unheard of in the world before, like, uh, you know, satellite data to see uh, where is the light in the night and uh, is something there or not? Is it kind of, you know, in the ocean? Then uh, they um, got uh, access uh, to a crowd-sourced um, data set where people were putting the data on local radiation. And because they had knowledge on radiation, they could understand that this data was not entirely correct because people were just reporting what they were seeing on the local devices. But uh, then they obviously introduced new data on weather, like humidity, wind flow, et cetera, to um, clean uh, the data set and uh, to make it available for computational purposes. So to make this long story short, uh, after six weeks, this team of scientists, uh, of data scientists, people skilled in algorithms and in artificial intelligence with the help of uh, the existing data on Japan before the disaster, they were capable to synthesize and put together the data set of the whole economy of the whole country. And uh, they provided uh, this data free uh, of charge uh, to the humanity. Uh, and uh, that was uh, a huge uh, progress uh, for the company and a demonstration what data science, what AI can do with the help of machines and then with great innovation coming from people. And here I'm just thinking about Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso said that uh, computers are actually quite stupid because they just give you answers. So it's up to us, up to humans, to ask important questions. And computers will enable us and help us to get answers to those questions. But it's up to us to define parameters, to kind of, you know, experiment uh, in order to set up the environment which will invite innovation and do something for the benefits of humanity. So it's quite a remarkable story and there are plenty of such stories around the globe. Uh, I would go now and ask a very simple question. What does it mean AI? So it's not science fiction. Um, artificial intelligence is a family of technologies. So there are multiple technologies under this a term umbrella artificial intelligence and obviously what those technologies do is to mimic what humans can do so for example our ability to see so computer vision is technology which allows machine to see or uh, our ability to hear and to speak so obviously Everything which is like Amazon Alexa or your local telecommunication provider developing voice interface to the local devices. So this is language technology, natural language processing. So machines would uh, process the language in order to be capable to respond in a meaningful way to a certain conversation, react uh, to a certain conversation. So mimicking human abilities and capabilities uh, to do certain things. This is what uh, uh, this technology family, artificial intelligence, is about. And um, this technology is quite old. Uh, so uh, 
if we look at Google and Google search, this, uh, those are mathematics from the 30s. And AI uh, is about mathematics from the 40s and 50s. And of course, there were, there were novelties, you know, 2006 to 2012, uh, you know, everything which is uh, around uh, modern uh, algorithms and neural networks, uh, the deep learning phase of AI, of machine learning, this is new. But the fundamentals are all uh, from the 40s and 50s. So without this fundamental work, uh, contemporary AI would not exist. And this is, by the way, why I am saying that this is so important for societies and for governments to invest and to support fundamental science. Because, uh, you know, applications and everything we use uh, it's all coming from the fundamental science and fundamental science uh, needs uh, to have certain liberties and freedom to experiment, uh, to fail, to invest in certain things which might not be fruitful uh, for the development of the economy right now. So let's not forget that so many things which uh, are more or less common uh, in our life, like let's say uh, those devices with touch screens, the technologies were developed in the 60s and in the 70s, and we only started to benefit from those uh, around 2008 and then 2010 and 2012. So uh, this investment in fundamental science is absolutely key in my eyes um, to move on, to move the whole humanity on. So uh, the family of technologies mimicking the human behaviors, but how? What is actually um, like um, an inspiration for those technologies uh, to, to evolve? And uh, most aspiration is actually coming from the human brain. And uh, what is quite interesting is that uh, uh, we, we still, we know a lot but we still lack a lot of understanding and we should be all very humble in judging uh, what is uh, there and what might be there in the years to come. Uh, we should uh, always pause before we claim that we decoded the human brain and we decoded the intelligence. So contemporary machine learning technologies in artificial intelligence are very much influenced by the neurocortex, which is the further part of the human brain. And neurocortex is uh, in charge uh, of uh, our speech, uh, of our sight, uh, our capability to hear, to process information, but the intelligence is not just about neurocortex. And for example, if we have right now technologies which are based just on neural cortex, it doesn't mean that we completely decoded intelligence. I will give you an example. The hippocampus um, is um, a part uh, of the brain uh, which has uh, a lot of functions. For example, a person, an intelligent person with Alzheimer's disease, um, might uh, look at two pictures and say, okay, I'm seeing this is a house and this is a house. So I see two houses. The person is intelligence, intelligent. The person can see, can process the information correctly. And the person with Alzheimer will say, those are two houses. But the person might not remember that one of those houses belonged to this person a while ago. So this uh, capability to absolutely correctly um, identify certain things and link those things uh, to the life of this person are not given any longer. And uh, this is one of the functions of hippocampus. And uh, obviously, Puna, we are uh, in a festival for literature. Uh, if you might remember, if some of, uh, of you read uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, who is a Russian author, uh, his novel, The Heart of the Dog, if you might remember, the professor Preobrazhensky there operated uh, on a dog and he removed the hippocampus from the dog's brain and he installed the hippocampus uh, of a deceased person uh, who used to be an alcoholic, who used to be a very nasty individual into the brain of this dog. And uh, of course, it's science fiction, it's not real, but what is happening in this novel is that the dog develops uh, 
the individuality and the personality of this deceased person who was killed uh, because there was a row in the pub and he was a nasty person, nasty individual. Out of sudden, this cute, uh, lovable dog transforms into this monster of a human. And uh, at the end of the novel, uh, Professor um, is uh, making what he was, what he did. He, he's taking this back and he um, he's executing the second surgery and removes uh, this uh, hippocampus um, of a human. Um, and he believes uh, that obviously hippocampus is giving us uh, individuality. And by the way, Michael Bulgakov was not very far apart from what we know about hippocampus today. So just to give you a certain flavor, there's still huge road to go, a huge way to go for us to completely understand uh, intelligence. Uh, and I am even not touching unconsciousness. Uh, here you might think about philosophy, religion, um, you know, ethics. What does it mean to be consciousness? Uh, are we talking about will? Does the free will exist? Uh, all questions which are highly interesting, even from the perspective of technology development and development of artificial intelligence. But uh, I don't want to talk a lot about theory. Let's be very, very practical. So um, my topic is AI and business. Uh, so what do we know about the impact of AI on a business? Um, at the beginning of the year 2000, uh, the top 30 companies in Germany, um, you know, companies like Daimler, like Allianz, Munich Reinsurance Group, Bayer, um, they had tremendous wealth. And of course, they were worth more than a very, very young Google back then. And nowadays, uh, this situation is completely reversed because Alphabet, Google is part of Alphabet Corporation, is worth more than all those German giants, uh, DAX companies, 30, top 30 companies all together. And uh, the value is not just uh, because uh, Google, let's say, invests uh, into healthcare or into um, self-driving car unit called Vimo. But this worth is coming the value from data. And uh, Google is obviously a very data-centric company. And uh, nowadays, uh, if you look at the index of Fortune 500, on the top 10 uh, of those 500 most valuable companies in the world, there are five data-centric companies. And those are companies which are based on the west coast of the United States. Uh, so this is, of course, Alphabet. This is, of course, Apple and Amazon, the trillion um, trillion uh, dollars companies um, in valuation. And then we have Facebook and um, we have Microsoft. So uh, the data economy, data centricity drives the valuation of those giants. And uh, if we look uh, into Asia, then we see that in China, the story uh, is repeating. So we have companies like Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, and they are growing in valuation because uh, they are very data-centric and they are very AI-centric. So not only those companies collect an insane amount of data, but they develop technologies in hardware and, and software to make use of this collected uh, treasure, which is data. So um, all those companies, for example, invest in their own uh, uh, semiconductors in silicon. And uh, I was working for one semiconductor company uh, in, my, uh, in the course of my professional career. It's, it's a huge task to design a semiconductor. It's very complex task. So, but those companies, they believe that if they invest and if they design their own silicon, then they will be capable to adjust this piece of hardware to the system coming on top of it and then optimize the deliverables of the whole technology stack, what we call, uh, and then uh, they will be more able, more capable to process the treasure they 
have and they believe they own and this is data. So um, they have data centers, uh, mostly based uh, in quite cold areas, uh, sometimes under the lakes, under the ponds, to cool the systems. And in those data uh, centers, obviously, this, the units of hardware are helping to process data. Then, of course, they deliver software, and then they deliver applications and services which we enjoy uh, as uh, businesses and individuals. But then uh, there's a question, if we have those um, huge giants, uh, like the five American companies and then the four Chinese companies, uh, what about the rest of us? What about uh, a mid-sized business uh, in India or a mid-sized business um, in Germany? Can they benefit from data? And this is the question which is very, very close to my heart. And this is the question which um, I uh, do quite a, a bit of research and uh, which I love to address uh, in, in my talks on artificial intelligence. So I believe that uh, everyone can benefit from data. I believe that really everyone can benefit from artificial intelligence uh, technologies, but uh, they should be certain environments created uh, to do so. And here sometimes we need uh, evolution and progress coming top down, let's say digital policy from the government, but there might be some movements coming bottom up because we can't expect uh, governments, uh, large international bodies to solve our problems. And sometimes innovation in a very democratic way can be more meaningful than uh, us expecting that someone else will intervene and solve our problems. So this is something which is really, really close to my heart. And uh, looking into the capabilities of data and AI, I believe that uh, those capabilities can make economies, societies, communities more sustainable. And you understand that we all are impacted by the climate change. We have so many problems like the pandemic. Um, we did not use AI a lot to work on COVID, but it could have been possible if we had more data. We could not utilize contemporary technologies a lot to look for the COVID vaccine but moving forward, we are definitely skilled to do so with the appropriate data sets and appropriate resources and appropriate willingness to try and fail, to try again, try even more and then succeed. So uh, let me kind of, you know, structure this uh, basic idea on how to make uh, AI technologies more accessible, more democratic, so all of us can benefit uh, from those. Um, and uh, I have in mind a number of points uh, which have to be recognized. And the point number one is actually that we all recognize that our data is valuable, full stop. So every person having access to the internet, even ev every thing having access to the internet with a sensor maybe, sending certain information somewhere, and every business, all of us and everything around us has digital shadows. So we all leave traces of data when we are posting certain things on Facebook. For example, I'm talking to you now, you might comment, um, you know, there's a stream of data going out there. Um, we produce a trail of data just while sitting here and listening to this talk. Um, every single person, every single thing, so we need to recognize that what we are producing here is not about noise, but this is meaningful and this is valuable. And right now, uh, this uh, being valuable is beneficial only to large data monopolies, the companies I was talking about before. So if we recognize that data is valuable, we might ask a question, who owns this data? And my fundamental belief is that the data should be owned 
by businesses and by individuals who are producing this data. And of course, uh, you know, while we own it, uh, we might say, you know, my movements now and my contacts are of no use, but they might be of use. Maybe some of us develop certain health condition. And then if the doctor is skilled, the doctor might say, okay, what is your nutrition? What uh, are your moving patterns? Uh, are you maybe jogging or doing yoga? Or, you know, what is your routine in sports? Or can I look at um, your family? There might be certain genetical informations which might make me understand what is wrong with your health condition. So if me as an individual having access to the pieces of my data in a certain way which I can present to this doctor, then I might expect that he will be capable to treat me better. So right now, I don't have this possibility because uh, the data is somewhere. It's with one doctor, with another doctor. Uh, you know, data on my nutrition is uh, with my fitness pal. And then, you know, data on, on my sports might be with Peloton. So, you know, I don't own my own data. Even if I sign like, you know, thousands and thousands of agreements, uh, yes, I understand you are using this whatever. So I please give me your service and I give you my data. But the data ultimately is of zero value to me. I can't take it and do certain things with it. So, and we all use those services. We are all on certain social networks. We all provide this digital shadows to companies benefiting from our data. And I believe that this ownership and the value should be brought to the source, to those who are producing this data. How can it be uh, done? And I believe that here uh, we need to ask a question whether what we are um, you know, using on a daily basis in internet uh, is the best uh, architecture and infrastructure of the uh, World Wide Web. And uh, it was not built for this amount of information and data. So the IP protocol, which is one of the most important protocols, might not be sufficient to incorporate everything. And still we need free internet, we need the access. I believe that uh, we need to experiment and invest and even try out uh, decentralized uh, architectures um, on the internet. And uh, here you might say, okay, now I'm overwhelmed. I'm a small business, I'm an individual. How should I even approach this? And uh, my saying is, uh, if you are data literate, if you are interested, there are sources which don't cost anything right now. Um, so in Berlin, for example, a group uh, of uh, AI scientists, uh, they develop ocean protocol and uh, they created uh, the very first uh, data market on the distributed ledger on blockchain uh, in a decentralized uh, architecture, in a decentralized setup. And when they opened this data market where uh, you can trade uh, your pieces of data, your, you know, enterprise data, even um, scientific data, individual data, and get something for it. Uh, so every data set there is a token. Every data set there has a value. After they open up this market, the traffic just exploded. And uh, when I look into it, it's just so interesting. So there are many local data sets on, on COVID. Uh, you know, variety, uh, whether this virus might mutate uh, and whether we might face uh, new symptoms. This data is very, very valuable uh, to uh, medical professionals, uh, to scientists uh, developing um, remedies uh, to treat uh, COVID as a disease. And of course, to those developing uh, vaccines and testing vaccines. Um, there is a, a data on the local environment. So we understand that so many centers in this world, including India, suffer from a very bad air and pollution. Uh, they are experiments which uh, crowdfund uh, 
local data on pollution and where software developers are coming and they're saying, okay, so here are technologies which might be used locally to improve the situation, to install certain filters, to clean up the air. It might be uh, in a very small scale at the beginning, but this is how internet started. And from my perspective, what I see right now, those distributed uh, technologies and data markets, uh, from the design, from the power, for, from the scaling perspective, it's like what internet used to be around um, 1998 and 1999. And uh, I frankly would welcome a genius uh, of the magnitude of, of, for example, Mark Andreessen, who created the Mosaic browser and uh, who actually made internet usable for normal people, not just for scientists, not for some, you know, IT geeks. It was really his doing uh, with the browser, with uh, the new usability. I expect that someone of his magnitude will uh, solve the usability problem um, on blockchain, on the distributed uh, ledger, on decentralized architectures to make uh, them more usable for small businesses, for individuals to experiment, to try out, uh, to, to approach. And I think that the potential of this is just mind blowing. Why is it important? Because, I mean, we have blockchain, it exists. But the problem is that if, for example, all Indian businesses now put their data on blockchain as it exists today, without new protocol, like the ocean protocol, then the infrastructure will break. Uh, it's not built for this purpose. So we need new protocol. We need uh, enthusiasts uh, like uh, Trent McGonaghy, uh, the uh, CTO of Ocean, who invests his personal money and his time to build it and to ship to everyone who is interested. So this is really a non-profit initiative. It's uh, an initiative based on enthusiasm but I see a lot of potential there. And such initiatives exist throughout of the world. Um, they exist in the Netherlands. Uh, I uh, saw a number of those in Barcelona, in Spain. Uh, they in, exist in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, but uh, people don't know a lot about them. They don't understand uh, the magnitude and the impact they might have on our lives. So and to make AI and data democratized, serving everyone. We absolutely need, in my eyes, ownership on data and the capability to connect to those who are skilled in software, who are skilled in algorithms and in data science. And the place to connect might be this distributed, decentralized data market space uh, on the distributed ledger, which is a blockchain. So something which is very, very close uh, to my heart and uh, um, which um, I would like to follow uh, up on. So uh, I'm seeing on my chat that there are a couple of questions coming. Uh, let me give you uh, a couple of uh, further um, examples. So um, I believe that communities, businesses might connect and they might, for example, establish something which uh, is uh, um, around uh, a data trust. I'll give you a couple of thoughts here. Um, internet, AI technologies, uh, they uh, will swallow a lot of world energy. People are not aware about uh, this aspect of uh, AI technology, but uh, for example, if Ronaldo, who is a huge star in soccer in the world, if he posts one picture on Instagram and he has like 200 million followers, if he posts just one picture to 200 million followers, it's the same amount of energy spent as six German households spent on energy consumption throughout the whole year. And uh, OpenAI, which is one of the uh, best uh, research uh, organization in AI worldwide, uh, 2019, they um, made it possible that the robotic hand could manipulate the Rubik's Cube. So just this manipulation uh, 
got so much uh, in energy, it could have been three nuclear power plants for an hour. We might ask what is needed and what is not needed. The United States, the Department of Energy calculates that uh, by the year of uh, 2030, 20% um, of all global energy will go on the behalf of uh, data centers and AI technologies. Obviously, Alphabet right now uses more energy than all airlines um, in the global industry altogether. And I'm on the board of EasyJet, which is an airline in the UK. And uh, we talk about energy consumption all the time. Um, Alphabet is claiming they use only renewables, but how much? It's not quite transparent. So this transparency and the environmental aspect of technology and of AI is hugely important. Uh, okay, um, I am looking right now, so I'm absolutely uh, happy if someone jumps into my session and asks a question. <sighs> Affect countries like India, where a large chunk of industry and workforce are in informal and unskilled section. Well, <laughs> it's very difficult to benefit uh, from something if you are completely disorganized. I mean, uh, you know, formal economy or informal economy, uh, you need uh, to be organized in a certain uh, way. So everything can benefit from AI. So, uh, you know, I had an example where um, a student uh, from, you know, data science student uh, went back for vacation um, to Japan and uh, his family, they were farmers and uh, they, they were having uh, a cucumber farm so apparently, I have no idea about, uh, you know, the task, but apparently uh, in farming cucumbers, there's a task uh, which is quite laborsome uh, to collect cucumbers of the same side, size. And if it's too long or somehow, you know, sh misshaped, then those are sorted out. And uh, this student built um, a machine uh, to sort the cucumbers, um, a robot which was sorting those cucumbers. And uh, the task went very fast and uh, the parents were happy. So this is obviously a small application uh, which was uh, purposeful uh, for this uh, very small uh, farming family business. So obviously India is a country with a huge uh, technology um, potential and uh, even in Pune you have uh, a lot uh, of uh, universities which uh, give you workforce uh, skilled uh, in those technologies uh, so if you attract uh, if you have maybe some local organization of software developer uh, and data scientists they might be helpful to your small businesses, but you need somehow to approach them, to organize in a certain way, to talk to them, because what you might produce is data, then you need to understand how to collect it, where to store it, so you might have a server somewhere, you might uh, approach people like Trent McGonaghy in Berlin, uh, doing the ocean protocol to put this data on the distributed ledger, and then you need to formulate the questions, what do you need? Because, you know, just uh, like we would like to have machine learning or we would like to, to have AI, this is a zero question for me because uh, it's nothing which will benefit you. You really need to ask a business question and then establish a dialogue uh, with uh, people skilled in data, how data and data technology might be beneficial to solve your business problem with the data capability and capabilities of AI technologies. So, but it's it's my personal great belief that uh, the size doesn't truly matter. You might organize in a way that you will share uh, certain data even with your competitors. So your product will be your own. A certain data will be in a pool. You will innovate on your piece uh, of a product but the fundamental research, a fundamental data crunch, it might be organized uh, jointly uh, in a kind of a data trust. So this is something which uh, should be looked at. Um, and uh, I uh, believe that we require data literacy in population and in society. And uh, here, 
obviously uh, I'm looking into China where uh, machine learning, uh, basic machine learning um, is being taught in schools uh, on the um, compulsory uh, basis, starting with the sixth grade. So kids who are 11 years old, they start uh, getting education in machine learning uh, and in data. And uh, in China as well, uh, there are initiatives starting in kindergarten to educate uh, on data. So I must admit that I would wish we had the same uh, in Germany, we don't, but I'm looking into Finland, a wonderful European country. So they have great program from the University of Helsinki, which did courses on machine learning and data free of charge for people who are really not uh, statisticians, not mathematicians, not nothing, you know, around computer, but they, they produce those courses, everyone can benefit from those. Um, look up uh, the website of the University of Helsinki. There is a, a local uh, non-profit organization uh, involved there into this initiative. It's supported and funded by the Finnish government. This is about democratization of knowledge on AI and on data. So something uh, which needs to happen in order to make benefit um, for the society, for local businesses, uh, for everyone. Um, are there uh, more questions? So what if the future uh, of AI, uh, what is the future of AI given the sudden changing lifestyles of people due to pandemic? Look, um, this is a very serious question. So first of all, uh, there are a couple of blocks. Uh, AI definitely has potential to uh, shorten um, how fast, for example, uh, the vaccine uh, is being researched and developed because um, they are machine learning technologies which um, will be used in drug discovery and vaccination discovery um, process. But the capability, if we have control of our data and if we for example donate this data to the organization researching a vaccine and we donate it's our uh, act of a free will um, it's like you know in a certain way organ donation obviously so in Europe so many people they carry this uh, passport and organ donation uh, so if uh, they disease then uh, someone uh, can get uh, the lungs or the heart and then they will live. So it's saving lives. In digital world, uh, digital data uh, might be as important as organ donation. It can save lives. If we donate our data uh, to the research institutions in an organized manner and they use uh, it to shorten the period, uh, how fast they can develop a vaccine uh, or a medication. So this is uh, one thing. Another thing is in pandemics, we are all obviously trapped uh, somewhere. And I totally understand that without access to connectivity, you can't do much in certain rural regions. This is why connectivity is so important and every initiative supporting connectivity is so important. But if you have connectivity and you can use time uh, to learn, to inform, and you have, for example, a local mayor or a local maybe business who will take leadership and inform the population, look, this is what you can learn. This is what we can inform you about. You pre-screen what might be useful for this uh, region. You know, certain regions they are very skilled in agriculture. So other they are skilled maybe in manufacturing certain devices or uh, textile industry or whatever it is. So just you know, AI is getting implemented and serving so many industries nowadays. There is information on everything on the web. There is information on uh, AI uh, from key universities. It's free of charge. But you need someone who is organized, a local business, local community leader who will say it's not just about, uh, let's say, healthcare reform and educational reform, but this is about technology literacy. It's about how to make use of technology for everyone. And I take leadership and I educate, I inform, I learn myself. So ultimately, AI is not just a question of technology, it's a question of leadership. And leadership 
can pop up on every corner of the society. Just don't wait from the prime minister and from, you know, someone in the United States or in Europe to give you a recipe. So in my eyes, uh, digital agenda in uh, the European U Union is not enough to make uh, AI democratic. Uh, it's actually a disaster. We need more. We need uh, local initiative and local leaders who will say enough of talking. Let's just try out. Let's build a local data trust on whatever it might be, your region, on textile industry, on, um, I don't know, agriculture, connected with weather condition, predict uh, forecast, uh, and uh, connect uh, to a local data science community, statistician community, and discuss with them what can we do together in this very small scale with this very, very small um, uh, project. So this is uh, what I would definitely uh, expect. Uh, any further questions, please, I, I love those. When you look on the big five uh, tech companies, um, is a protocol like Ocean working against the strategy? <laughs> Brilliant question. The answer is actually yes. So um, obviously, um, you know, this is something not under their control and you would never hear anyone from Facebook or from Alphabet claiming, let's do decentralization. Uh, they will say, look, we are working on uh, implementing privacy in data. We are working, for example, on federative learning. This is something which is, um, you know, uh, an approach uh, to um, enable uh, learning on a data set uh, which uh, is not clear where the source is, for example, where um, our personal information is disguised or uh, we can do certain things on um, on cryptography, yeah, homomorphic cryptography. So the algorithm will crunch data without decrypting data. So this is something where Google will invest and, in, you know, but they will never ever support Ocean or similar initiatives uh, on the large scale because this is against, um, the strategy, um, it's against uh, the value. So democratization and uh, decentralization is to empower all kinds of businesses and communities with power of technologies. It's against, uh, you know, those monopolies. And we are living in the era of uh, data monopolies. But if someone asks me, is it too late, you know, did we uh, lose this battle? I mean, frankly, still, Internet is quite new. I mean, it's still like uh, 30 years in existence. Um, and, uh, you know, internet changed, uh, supply chain, internet changed uh, how we sell. So all, all those online stores, online capabilities. So this is what internet changed. But this is just like 20 to 25% of global economy. AI, machine learning can change 100% of global economy. And we need tools, we need new approaches to architecture and infrastructure to enable this change. So this is something what uh, I definitely want to research in uh, my new book on data and uh, sustainability, though I've already re uh, written about it in my uh, book, uh, The AI Imperative, um, Practical Roadmap uh, for Businesses. Um, any further question? So I'm seeing another question. Where is then my possibility to avoid that my data are going to be abused? Yeah, I trust an organization once and then I lose my trust. Well, uh, and that's the point. Uh, it's just one single individual, you can't really do much. And uh, obviously in Europe, we have this GDPR, which protects uh, from you know huge abuse uh, and they are lobbying initiatives by the government um, you know European Union data and privacy uh, those are just religions right now you know uh, but it's not uh, progressive in innovative because it's just you know defending defeating or repeating the story of success uh, from the United States and China. So we need we need a different approach. Uh, we need innovation and investments, for example, on this decentralized uh, infrastructure. So uh, 
no one uh, I know uh, actually reads uh, terms and conditions when you sign up for service. And uh, when you are in a course uh, to serve uh, to sign up for service, you just lose your patience. And then you are unnerved and you just say, okay, just thick, I accept. Uh, and then uh, you are confronted with all the cookies. Uh, so they are services which completely uh, protect you. They are search engines which uh, protect you. They are specific privacy-led browsers which protect you. The usability of those is still not great. But please, please befriend me on LinkedIn uh, so I can give you a couple of hints and a couple of tools um, to benefit uh, from the technologies which are more privately architected than uh, the technologies of big platforms. It, and actually, just be very conscious what you post and what you use uh, your social media for. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, LinkedIn is uh, my platform of choice. Uh, I'm professional. I mean, I, I need to read uh, stuff on technologies, on economies, on AI, uh, you know. I post a lot on LinkedIn. Uh, so I, I am on Facebook. I use Facebook really for cats. Um, you know, some exchange with my neighbors and stuff like, okay, uh, are we meeting on Sunday? Doing uh, what? What are we doing? I'm on a lot of private Telegram channels and um, those channels, uh, which are not really uh, fantastically uh, designed. Uh, they are not very comfortable as a Facebook um, field. But uh, they are private. So there I share ideas which I don't want to, to, to completely disclose uh, to, to those uh, social networks. So, you know, the, the, it's not ideal, but if you are looking for solutions, you will definitely uh, find those. Uh, are you capable to completely avoid uh, the abuse? Uh, at this moment uh, of history, you wouldn't be capable to avoid it. So uh, then we are seeing, uh, let's, okay, good. <laughs> so um, I would like, uh, you know, to close. Uh, and um, this is uh, with a quote of Abdaik, who is, um, um, you know, a writer. And he said that uh, people don't understand um, uh, the future and the innovation if their livelihood depend on what they're used to and what they have been doing, um, you know, uh, in the past. So Sinclair said it, and this is what I uh, see a lot in businesses, in communities, in uh, local governments. But I see signs of leadership too. And uh, actually uh, my call is here, don't believe uh, if you are not a data scientist or a software engineer, then uh, it's all over for you. Just uh, be curious and try things out. Uh, you have more power uh, than you believe to have. Um, and reach out to people uh, who have like minds uh, and uh, who might have... Uh, similar goals um, and uh, try things out. Uh, so that would be my call to round up it. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I'm immensely grateful for this opportunity uh, to talk to this audience. Uh, it's fantastic uh, what we go through in this pandemic that we connect uh, with those simple methods um, digitally, online, to spread the world of literature, education, technology, uh, and innovation. Um, I applaud it, and I'm looking very much forward to connect uh, to some of you, for example, on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, I am to be found under um, Dr. So, uh, D.R.A. Lauterbach, uh, and on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. it's just my name. That's an informative and captivating talk. Our next session begins at 8 p.m. Please join us for the mysteries of the cosmos and us after this short break. <laughs>